Welcome everyone to the DeNovo Elements Nutrition Panel. This is our Nutrition 2 panel. Uh, thank you for coming back and as always for submitting your questions. Uh, we have nine questions this month. This is Ben Esgro and I am joined by Dr. Peter Fitchin and Mike Niadlik, who will be soon to be uh, Mike Niadlik, our MSRD. Um, so as usual, uh, we don't really beat around the bush. We'll get right into the questions. The first question is, what is the best macro ratio for pre and post workout meals? Should fats be minimal or not? Uh, Mike Niadlik, will you start us off? Actually, you know what? Really quick. Sorry, guys. I kind of jerked you there. Um, just a, a real quick uh, announcement of, of um, kind of the chaos that we have is we, we always try to get everybody involved as much as we can, but there's so many um, variable schedules that um, Eric Helms couldn't make it because uh, he's in Belarus for Worlds. And then um, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, I believe, was going to ISSN. Uh, so um, it's just it's just the three of us, and we will do our best to uh, split ourselves into being five or six uh um, varied opinions. Sorry about that, Mike. Uh, I'll repeat the question again. And uh, Mike, you can start us off. So the first question is, what is the best macro ratio for pre and post workout meals? Should fats be minimal or not? Sure. So when we look at pre and post workout meals, we want to consider the goals of each. So the pre workout meal is going to get us ready for the training session and the post workout meal is going to help us recover from it. So if we assume that we're having three to five evenly portioned protein servings throughout the day, this leaves about 20 to 30% of our daily protein at each of those. Um, since fat isn't going to be a primary fuel source during most um, intense uh, training sessions, we can keep it lower at these meals. Uh, and fat's also going to slow digestion at these times when we want to get nutrients in our, uh, into our system. So I like to keep fat around 15 to 20% at each of those meals. And then the importance is going to be placed upon carbohydrates uh, because they're going to be the primary fuel source during the training session. And then after the training session, there's increased glucose sensitivity. Um, so those being the case, it would make sense to have the majority of our carbohydrates at these times. So I like about 25 to 30%. Um, and then there are a couple particular considerations. Um, and that's that split, that's split 15, 15, you said, right? So 15 pre and 15, 15% oh, no. post. No, sorry. Um, 25, uh, 25 to 30% at each. So, so they're getting 60% of their fat pre and 60 or between pre and post workout, they're getting 60% of their fat for the no, day. I'm talking, I'm talking about carbohydrates right now. Oh, sorry. I'm, 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 I'm lost. I, I will shut up. Continue Mike. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll, uh, I'll double back around just to make sure that's clear. Yep. So if we're assuming that we're having three to five evenly portioned protein servings throughout the day, that leaves us uh, about 20 to 30% protein at each meal. Um, fat about 15 to 20% at each and then carbohydrates about 25 to 30% at each. So total, this puts about 50 to 60% of our carbohydrates around the training session. And then some considerations as far as carbohydrates. Um, if we have just one training session within a 24 hour period, the, the importance on replenishing glycogen, this can just be done throughout a normal eating pattern of a carbohydrate rich, um, rich diet. But if we have multiple training sessions within one day and the prior training session was pretty intense and glycogen depleting, we're going to have an increased importance on replenishing that glycogen. So if that's the case, I like about one gram per kilogram of carbohydrates uh, as soon as the training session ends until the next, uh, the next training session. Um, and then as far as pre-workout type of carbohydrates, if you're a type of individual who is subject to GI distress during a training session, uh, it might be beneficial to keep uh, the carbohydrates lower in fiber and more simple at that pre-workout meal. And then I'll just wrap it all up by saying that, you know, these are all just guidelines and not necessarily hard rules. If a meal deviates, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, it's going to be more important to hit your overall calories and macros throughout the day consistently. Yep. 
so before we move on for Pete um, to give his input, um, I guess I'm just kind of fixated on the fat because that was the second part of the question. So you gave the percentage of carbohydrate, and I think you kind of uh, touched on percentages for fat pre and post. Um, and I think we'll probably all agree that they should be should be minimal at that time for the reasons you, you mentioned. But um, percentage wise, what so what percent of their fat for the day should be distributed between between pre and post workout for, for from your perspective? I like about 15 to 20 percent at each. No more than no more than 20. So 30 to 40 percent of their total fat for the day is going to be around the workout. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to um, uh, like elucidate before, but that was that was my bad. Um, Pete, give us your input on that one. All right. So, I mean, I think Mike Mike did a pretty good job of addressing this, but I think a couple other things I would add. Um, one is, you know, I think you need to keep into, take into consideration what someone's total intake is. Also, you know, somebody in the off season, they're probably gonna, you know, if you have a guy with a fairly fast metabolism, eating like 400 grams of carbs a day, you're probably going to be having carbs spread throughout the day and you're going to have plenty for pre-workout, post-workout, all your other meals, you know, things like that. Uh, but, you know, someone who's, you know, grinding in the depths of prep, um, you know, I know my last prep, a vast majority of my carbs were coming in pre-workout, post-workout and pre-bed so that I could sleep because um, I'm someone who sleeps better when I'm not hungry and have more in my stomach. Um, and so, you know, at that time, I, I would say, yeah, I probably 60, 70% of my carbs were coming from, or, or carbs for the day were coming combination of pre and post workout, you know, when my intake was really low. In the off season, you know, I'll get up 500 plus grams of carbs a day. It's just another meal. I mean, it's, you know, at that point, it, I, I, I don't, you know what I mean? I'm not really distributing yep. anything more there. So I think a lot of it, be, you know, comes to, you know, what, what's your total intake? What do you have kind of to, to spare for the day? I mean, if, if you're scraping bottom and you only have so many carbs, you probably want to put more of them around your workout. But if they're really high, it's probably just another meal in terms of carb intake. Um, another thing I was going to add is, you know, oftentimes I find with clients, there are individual differences. And I know you mentioned, um, you know, lower fiber foods for people who have more GI distress. Um, and, and sometimes I've had clients who feel sluggish when they eat carbohydrates. And so for them, it's, you know, what can you get away with pretty much without feeling like you're going to take a nap in the gym? Um, and, you know, I, I, so there's some individual differences there also that, that I, I try to take into account. Um, I know for me personally, I tend to perform better having a lot of carbs before my workout, uh, having food in my stomach. Um, my... You know, I have, you know, especially if I'm squatting heavy or something where I need core stability, having a little bit more in there, a little bit of bloat can help yeah. me stay more upright. Um, yeah. You know, especially. It'll, it'll also keep people away from you at the spot. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, especially as I get lean, I mean, I, I start losing core stability. And the fact that my waist is like 28, 29 inches on stage is a great thing for a bodybuilder. But, uh, you know, as a power lifter or someone trying to move heavy weight that, that makes staying upright in the hole a heck of a lot more difficult. Um, so that was another thing. And then the other thing I was going to say is you mentioned, you know, four or five protein, you know, feedings a day. And, um, you know, one thing I was going to add is, you know, I think the length of the workout probably would dictate, you know, how soon after my workout I would be having something, you know, if, if you're having a meal, you know, two hours before your workout, and then you go through like a long two hour workout, you probably want to get your next meal down pretty quickly, you know, after your workout. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if you're someone who, you know, you, you ate a meal, I don't know, an hour before your workout, you did a little, you know, shorter 30, 45 minute session, you probably have a little more leeway time-wise, um, you know, post-workout. Um, but, you know, and then also, you know, if you're training fasted, um, I would, I would probably put a lot heavier emphasis on getting fast digesting carbon protein in post-workout. Um, cause in the fasted state protein degradation does spike a heck of a lot more than when you trade in the fed state. Um, but those are about the only points I would add. I think Mike really summed it up pretty well. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, just try to give kind of a brief synopsis of, uh, what I feel were the key things that both you guys brought up and then I'll just pepper it with a little bit of personal anecdote as well. 
Um, I think the biggest key thing, really two things I, I wrote as I was listening to you guys, uh, was one is, I think this is an important question for anybody to ask themselves, or it, this is really the meat of that question, is what is the real tangible difference of, um, I guess, getting really caught up in this uh, pre and post workout distribution uh, and fat ratio? Um, and, and I do think it comes down to uh, like a, a kind of a cost benefit thing, um, meaning for the, for the athlete, one of the biggest things that is usually done working with athletes is, um, if they handle something as like a pre-workout ritual that maybe it doesn't adhere to these textbook definitions of like what fat distribution it should be and what carbohydrate, but they're so used to it and it actually behaviorally makes them perform better. Um, it's probably not a good idea to throw something in just because, uh, in theory, it's going to be better for them, um, because they're so dependent and used to that and they know they can tolerate it, which I think is a huge, a huge part. Um, so what are, what are really the key things that people need to really worry about within this question is number one, as Mike brought up, um, their total intake, caloric intake throughout the day. Um, so one little, I guess, side brief story from my perspective is, um, this is now a couple years ago when I last prepped for shows. Um, I really, I really, my main focal point was just sticking to my total daily numbers and not getting too caught up in, you know, any kind of distribution things. Cause the bottom line is once I got really low, like around 5%, I was just hungry. So I remember I was driving home from somewhere and I, I had a box of fiber one bars and I ate one, I ate two, I ate the whole box. Oh. And that was, that was my pre-workout meal. It had to be because it, it took up, it took up like 60 or 70% of my <laughs> carbohydrates for the day. And I would regularly kind of do that. I'd wake up and I'd eat like a 1500 calorie or 2000 calorie breakfast, which was like 60 or 70% of my calories for the day. Um, and then the rest of the day, I would basically just have left for enough protein and, you know, post-workout stuff. And it was pretty low in carbohydrates and fat. And it, it didn't impact me, um, at all from, from reaching my goals of how lean I wanted to get. Um, and I realize, you know, most people who are listening probably have no idea about that, but, um, I, I definitely, I definitely got lean. Uh, and, um, like I said, I, I it, it didn't kind of mess anything up. So again, the, the, the key point of really what I'm trying to address in that is something that, that both Mike and Pete kind of hit on, which is your, your energy is really the most important thing. And, and once that's taken care of, then we can kind of trickle down to these other things. Um, and then a big part um, is just the individualization of things, which I kind of, you know, soapboxed a little bit and, and everybody did. So, uh, hopefully that gives people some additional context, uh, on, I just wanted to add somewhat of like, I guess the, the unknown area, cause you guys really hammered the theoretical down, uh, really well, uh, before we move on, you guys have anything additional that you would like to, um, highlight or mention? No, I'm good. No, I, I think we summed it up pretty well. Okay, excellent. So we will move on to question two, which is, it seems after heavy training days, specifically squat days, my appetite after training is almost insatiable. What advice do you give for a female powerlifter who is full swing into meat prep? So Mike Niadlik, we'll have you start with that one again as well. Sure. Yeah, so this kind of transitions really nicely. So we were talking about, you know, individualizing, you know, the, the meal distributions based on you know, that individual and what they're going through at that specific time. So if you're just really insatiable at the end of a training session, you might just allocate more of your calories post-workout. Um, additionally, you know, the inclusion of more voluminous foods, foods that are higher in fiber. Um, you know, maybe this is an instance where you do incorporate a little bit more fat because fat is satiating. Um, but I think one thing to also consider is, you know, if you are in meat prep and you're dieting, at some point, hunger is just kind of something that you do have to deal with. Controlled starvation, man. Like that's really what dieting for a show is. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if anyone else has any other tips they want to throw into that. Uh, we'll just go in the same order. So Pete, you can go next and then I'll just throw in whatever else I have. All right. Yeah. I, I think, I think that pretty much sums it up pretty well. I mean, I, when I'm working with clients, we try to allocate more foods typically to times that will help them, state you know usually my focus is 
you know, how can we keep you consistent with your numbers and performing well in the gym? And so we kind of addressed, you know, the performing well in the gym in the first question. Um, and so the consistency with your numbers, you know, that, that could just be moving intake around throughout the day where people are more hungry. So in this case, you know, moving a little bit more of your intake post-workout since that's a time where you're more hungry. Um, you know, some people have, have more hunger. It's common for a lot of people to have hunger at night. So, you know, for those people, maybe saving a little bit more of their intake for at night um, may be beneficial. But, you know, it, it ultimately comes down to, you know, staying consistent with your numbers throughout the day. So, you know, especially if you're prepping for a meet and dieting and trying to make a weight class, um, you know, that's going to be key to keep you in a, you know, energy deficit and progressing. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the only thing I really have to add there is I'm just going to throw in a couple things that I've done in the past, um, aside from my crazy fiber one box, uh, journeys, um, which I wouldn't really recommend to anybody else unless you do train alone. Yeah, I, hope um, you didn't, I hope you didn't squat that day. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I, here's, here's the irony as a side note is normally, and I mean, we could probably, I'm going to do my best to not have us tangent too hard here, but one of the craziest thing I noticed was when I was really, really low in, I never really got low in numbers, but when I was really low in body fat, um, the typical effect I'd get from fiber was significantly diminished. So um, if, if I'm, I guess, eucaloric or, or eating normal uh, daily eating patterns, a lot of fiber will obviously make me, make me gassy. Um, whereas when I was really deep into prep, I ate that box of fiber one and I was fine. Um, like the only thing that actually affected me was, was sugar alcohol. Um, so I, I don't, I, I think it's an interesting thing. I mean, is it an efficiency thing? Like when you're actually that low, like you're maybe extracting a little bit more from, uh, from soluble fiber. I, I, I don't know. There, there is some evidence of that. I've, I've actually seen that, that part of the whole metabolic adaptation when dieting, one of the things is like gut bacteria in periods of low energy can extract more from your, your food you're eating. You well, know, so. I am definitely N of one in, in that, in that, uh, scenario for sure. Um, cause I noticed that I haven't really dieted in a long time, but whenever I do, um, I, I tend to t like, I don't know, extract the energy from fiber more efficiently without getting the GI distress. I also wonder if your gut microbiota changed at that time. That's yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think what, what Pete was kind of alluding to yeah. and I'm sure I know there has been last time I went to experimental biology, that was a huge topic. Like everybody was kind of talking about microbiota and it does. I mean, it does significantly just like you'd expect if you had a, a, a Petri dish with different, um, compositions of nutrient agar, you would, grow different strains of bacteria better, the same thing happens in your stomach. And that's basically what they're displaying is, you know, the difference between different types of fats, saturated or unsaturated, different types of, uh, like sugars and stuff. So, um, everything affects everything basically, I guess is we're, what yeah. we're getting at. And For sure. yeah, we had an entire seminar series. One of my last semesters in grad school on, uh, the gut microbiome. And all I can say from that seminar series is, it's complicated as hell and there are yep. way, 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 way more questions than there are answers. And so all these people who are selling this or that for your gut microbiome, it, they don't know. Like there, there are so yep. many questions, um, you know, in general, eating fiber is a good thing. But I mean, aside from that, like either I don't know that you can conclude much else. There's just too many questions. You know, they, they, they still don't know, you know, obese people have a different gut microbiota than lean people, but they don't know if yep. that's they don't know if that's genetically caused that makes them predisposition to being obese or if that being obese and the, what they're actually intaking in the diet makes that gut microbiota change. Physiology is humbling. Um, so I, I think, I think something that's important for anybody who's, who's listening or who listens to any of these to, to really, um, take away as well is you can have a panel of so-called experts in, in really, um, even in academia or anything, but, but the reality is we're still all trying to figure this stuff out too, um, and connect the dots best we can. Uh, and yeah, I mean, especially when you, when you go and dive deeply into one specific aspect of physiology, just like that, just like the microbiome. Um, 
So it's important to keep that in, in mind too, is, um, you always got to keep an open mind, uh, cause stuff, we might find something out in like a month, um, that I guess can completely flips everything we thought. Um, anyway, uh, back to the, the, the two things I want, or the things I wanted to drop in on the question. Um, one of them was really what, what Mike, uh, mentioned, which was voluminous foods. Uh, so I used to actually have sugar-free jello a lot that helped a lot when I'd have lower carbohydrates. Um, cause they're super low in calories. Actually gelatin is, is protein. Um, so, uh, I'd pretty much just get mostly protein from it cause they're, they don't have, uh, any, any sugar or fat. And the other thing was, which I think is, is like an unsung hero of dieting is our carbonated beverages. Um, because carbon dioxide's a gas, it takes up volume. Um, that's why you burp after you consume it. Um, so that actually helped a ton. Whenever I'd get really hungry, the pangs would be really bad. You're getting two things. It's you're getting, um, liquid, which will cause your stomach to expand and you're getting gas within the liquid. So you're kind of doubling down on the expansion with, with no calories. Um, so those, those were big things for me with, uh, satiety when things got relatively low for, for me. Um, as usual, I will let you guys, uh, chime in before we move on anything, uh, Pete. I was just going to say xanthan gum and making fluff um, was, yep. was one of my go-tos really deep in prep last year when I was desperate and hungry. <laughs> yes, all of those those fibers like glucoman and I used to make pancakes with it. I'd buy the, the powder and uh, that was kind of a lifesaver as well. Um, Mike, anything else there before we move on? No, I'm good with this one. Okay. Question three. This is This is definitely a Pete question. Um, for fat loss, do you need one gram of protein per pound of body weight or per pound of lean body mass? Take it away, Pete. Oh man. So this, I think the last time we recorded one of these, we talked about splitting hairs and I think we're, yep. we're, we're doing that with this question. Um, you know, I think the important thing is the general concept that you're getting adequate protein. And, you know, I think with Eric's, you know, some of Eric Helms research, you know, there's probably some evidence that when you're dieting, especially when you're dieting and very lean uh, and resistance training, there may be a need for more protein when you're dieting than um, when you're not. And so I think at this point, based on the literature, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, somewhere if you're not dieting somewhere in like the 0.8 to 1 gram per pound range, and that's probably even erring on the side of caution. But, you know, we're bodybuilders. We, we err on yep. the side of caution when it comes to protein. Um, when you're dieting, I mean, some of Eric's stuff suggests up to 1.3-ish. Um, you know, there could be a benefit in a deficit when you're really lean. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, that's going to come down to also you, you need adequate carbohydrate, adequate, you know, you need some carbohydrate, you're going to need adequate fat. You only have so many calories to go around, and so it's going to come down to balancing. But, yes, you know, adequate protein is important. Now, getting to, you know, gram per pound or gram, you know, of lean mass versus body weight, you know, if someone's overweight, I would say absolutely probably be looking at like an estimated lean mass um, because, you know, if someone's, I don't know, 300 pounds and overweight, um, you know, they, they don't necessarily need 300 grams of protein a day when they're dieting. Um, yeah. But, you know, for someone who's dieting for a show, maybe it's like a 180 pound guy dieting down to 160. I mean, either is probably going to be okay if you're relatively lean, especially if you're extremely lean. Um, I don't know. I, I think this one's just splitting hairs. I mean, especially if you're, you know, for someone who's leaner, I would say for someone who's obese, I would definitely go gram, you know, per lean body mass. Um, cause otherwise you're going to spend a lot of your caloric intake on protein that probably isn't necessary. Yep. Uh, Mike, uh, what you got for us? No, I think, uh, I think Pete summed it up pretty well. Um, I don't have anything to add on that one. So the, the only additional thing that I'll kind of pitch in there is um, something, Mike, since you're preparing for the, the RD exam, um, I'm sure you've heard this before because it, it came up quite a bit uh, in clinical nutrition talks, which is there are new, no nutrition emergencies. And the, the funny part there is we're talking clinical nutrition where we're talking like, like life support, life-saving, like 
total peripheral nutrition, which is people don't take anything by mouth. They're getting fed through a vein literally for their life. There, there's no nutritional emergencies there. But for a fitness person, everything's a nutritional emergency. <laughs> so I, I find that, that kind of comical. Um, so I just wanted to give some, some relativity to that question because the reality is when we talk about things like, like Pete was talking about is, you know, the data and showing some type of difference, we're talking statistical. And, and I think it, it is a pretty large difference between tangible difference. So if we're talking going and, and we've, we kind of revolve around this idea of adequacy versus deficiency quite a bit in this. And, and the reason is um, that it is actually tremendously important when we're talking about um, really training or nutritional uh, intervention or things. So if, if you did something that I don't think any person who's even read one muscle magazine would do, which is go down to like half, half a gram uh, of protein per pound of body weight or something, would you see a difference between that and a gram for sure? Um, but if you're still training, uh, that's going to be driving a lot of this stuff. Like it's not protein, like eating protein foods alone and no training that that's really doing a heck of a lot for you muscle mass wise, unless you were eating a deficient protein diet before. And I know, um, Pete and probably Mike as well, uh, a lot of the stuff that I, I remember from, uh, a lot of the, the research I was reading with, with protein metabolism was when they were feeding it for elderly people who were actually under consuming protein, they were seeing a, a pretty significant difference in lean body mass. But again, they were under consuming and they also are different. Um, they have a different response. They're not as, um, sensitive to, to the amino acids. So, um, I think it's just very important also to keep some context for this question, um, which is if you're around one gram per pound, you're probably fine. Like Pete said, um, if it's driving you kind of nuts about like hitting this perfect magical amount, you're honestly wasting mental time and effort, um, because highly unlikely you're going to see, um, much of much of a tangible difference even if 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 we were talking about like statistically we saw an individual who uh maybe had a five percent difference in um in muscle protein synthesis or something in, in a study uh i think most people i'm, I'm going to speak uh this is my personal opinion most most males will probably be focusing on like upper body mass like they're never going to look at like their quad and say man i'm losing muscle in my quad <laughs> um and uh the the idea that you're really going to see that visually that that small percent change especially in in a in a small muscle group is so low because just like you'll notice growth in larger muscle group groups first you're going to probably notice differences there too um so even if we said there was the statistical difference this five percent um Man, the, the idea of actually seeing that in a mirror without having a billion confounding variables is like, it's probably more head games than it is actually objective. Um, so thank you guys for tolerating my tangent. Um, anything else you guys wanted to capstone that with? No. no. Okay, that was good. We, we were in unison there. Uh, <laughs> fourth question is, when in a cut, is it a good time to implement a refeed if progress is still being made slowly on current calories? They remember Eric Helms speaking about doubling their carbs and 10% less protein and fat for the day. I would think one can add one refeed day for a mental break after months of dieting. They're currently four months in. So we'll just do the same order again. Uh, Mike Niadlik, you can start us off there. Sure. Yeah. So refeeds are, are a pretty common implementation. Um, there's a, there's a, a number of benefits to them. Um, so we'll just start by defining it. Um, and it's really just a controlled feeding, um, at maintenance or a slight surplus. And it's typically for 24 hours and most of the time, uh, once or twice per week. Um, so if you're someone who's increasing the number of refeeds, uh, whether it be from zero to one to two, uh, you're going to want to factor in, um, your average weekly caloric intake. Um, so if you have, if, you, if now you're increasing calories on you know one or two days, that's going to increase your average weekly intake. And in order to maintain that average deficit, you're going to need to lower calories on those particular dieting days just to just to maintain that same rate of loss. Um, and then as far as you know what those calories look like, uh, 
we're definitely going to put an emphasis on carbohydrates. Um, so we, I don't tend to focus on particular percentages to lower protein and fat. Um, really, if you're, you know, like we talked about in the last question, if you're keeping protein around, you know, one gram per pound, um, if your protein was higher than that before, you might lower it to one gram per pound on that refeed day and then allocate those calories towards carbohydrates. And then similar to fat, if, if you want to personally lower fat so you can allocate more calories towards carbohydrates, um, really the majority of your calories should be coming from carbohydrates on that day. And that's going to provide a couple benefits. Uh, number one, just in general, the refeed, it's going to be a psychological break from the diet. Um, just having one day at maintenance or a slight surplus, it might not be so burdensome, so tiring. Uh, it can help with prolonged adherence and consistency, um, energy levels, and performance. Um, so we're focusing on carbohydrates So because, as we mentioned before, that's going to be a primary fuel source during training sessions. So during that refeed, we're looking to replenish glycogen stores, and if you're a bodybuilder, that's going to be what helps you fill out, looks fuller. Um, and then there's another uh, more theoretical reason for focusing on carbohydrates, and it has to do with leptin and metabolic rate. Um, so during a diet, there's a number of physiological changes that we know occur. Obviously, we get leaner, um, our energy levels get lower, our hunger goes up, um, our metabolic rate will start to slow. Um, and then there's also going to be a number of hormonal changes. Um, and one of those hormones is leptin. So leptin decreases during a diet. So leptin is a satiety hormone secreted by fat cells. And as we diet and we deplete fat cells, leptin concentrations decrease. So there's some, there's some information that suggests that leptin and metabolic rate are associated and that uh, leptin is sensitive to carbohydrate refeeding uh, more so than fat or protein. So an acute carbohydrate refeeding may temporarily raise leptin levels, and that might have a modest, and I emphasize modest, impact on metabolic rate. But that we need more research on that particular reason for it, um, but it's something to consider. Pete, um, you could jump in there before I, I take a stab. Yeah, I, I think Mike summed it up pretty well. I mean, the, the major reasons for taking a refeed and, and, you know, and those would be, you know, mental break, which I think is probably the biggest. I know during my prep, you know, I would always take Sunday as an off day, have my high carb day that day. Um, and then I'd go in the gym and train, you know, lower body Monday morning. Um, but that Sunday was always nice because I could sit around, have a mental break, day off from the gym, eat a little bit more food. You know, and, and that kept me kind of consistent and going for the week. Um, the other thing, yeah, glycogen. And so I kind of talked, mentioned that too, that, you know, I think that if, if you're going to refeed, um, I would try to make it the day of or the day prior to, you know, one of your most difficult workouts to improve performance. Um, you know, some people, when they have a higher carb day, feel more sluggish. So for them, maybe the day prior is a good idea um, to their hardest workout. Uh, other people doesn't bother. So maybe the day of. Uh, if you're going to train later in the day, I, I probably would do it the day of, if you're going to train in the morning, probably the day prior, um, cause you probably aren't going to get many carbs in, you know, before your workout. Uh, but again, that's, that's a lot of individual personal preference. Um, and then, you know, he, he, Mike also mentioned, uh, leptin. Um, I'm pretty sure thyroid follows a similar pattern where you can, if you, carbohydrate overfeeding increases thyroid hormone, I believe as well, you know, acutely, just short period of time, it goes back down once you start dieting like leptin. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure I've seen a study where fat and protein overfeeding didn't do that and carbohydrate did. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think Mike summed it up pretty well. Yeah, I agree. I think you did an excellent job there, Mike, uh, kind of covering all the bases on, um, on theory and uh, really if anybody didn't know why why people are kind of implementing these uh, that was that was an excellent uh, overview um, I think I think the only other things I'd add is um, I remember uh, when this be became when this really started becoming uh, a, a common and I guess popular thing to do um, it was a, a lot of based on a lot of like Lyle McDonald um, stuff and he wrote pretty exhaustively on it. And I think 
I think I think we're still at the place, and you guys could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're still at the place where we're kind of stabbing at a lot of theoretical stuff, and we really don't have anything hugely solid other than it definitely helps um, subjectively for multiple reasons, uh, having those higher days, especially longevity-wise, like staying on a diet longer and um, performance-wise in the gym, and like Pete said, with, with glycogen, like stuff that we can actually feel, because obviously you don't, you know, no one's no one's crazy enough to like. I would probably do it, but um, to to actually have you know this this twenty four hour uh, serum leptin measurement uh, going where they can say, oh, that's definitely I can feel it. That's my leptin going up from the reef. <laughs> you know what I mean? okay. um, so I think I think a lot of people, and you can probably ask twenty different um, people who do consulting, and you'd probably get a slightly different variation on how they do it. Um, and what their kind of theory is behind it. So um, the the only things I'm actually going to present are somewhat counterpoints to this, uh, just to in an attempt to give people, um, I guess, a holistic um, perspective on, on, on who's listening. One of them is consider the other side, which is, and, and I've actually noticed this with somewhat with myself and with, with clients I've worked with, is do the blood glucose variations from that large, carbohydrate feeding, do they mess with long-term adherence? Um, Because the bottom line is adherence is king. Um, So because we've set up this almost almost paradigm of uh, everybody's doing refeeds and the people who are really successful are doing them, doesn't mean that they're like a necessity and they're set in stone. Even if all of this, you know, data that we've amassed, um, you know, is backing that idea up, there are people that I noticed were having a harder time with adherence um, by putting the refeeds in and we actually took them out and it, and it helped. So I think, I think it's definitely a, a wise idea to defer, to um, have them in there, but you have to, it's, it, again, it backs up the idea of following up with somebody on numerous levels um, and seeing why, if there's adherence issues, why they are, because that, that could be a potential thing, because you do get a pretty massive blood glucose change. Again, that's what's influencing the, the leptin uh, levels and the insulin, because they're actually closely tied. So that's, a, that's a, a big point I wanted to bring up. Another one that Mike really did an excellent job of, and I'm just going to reiterate, is uh, balancing things out for the week. Um, so what we're really looking at with interventions is, is the stimulus over time, not, not the acute change. I know a lot of people get or I've heard before people say like, I feel fat after a meal, like I feel like I'm gaining fat. While acutely that might happen, what really matters for your long-term body composition changes is what you do long-term. So um, if you do these refeeds, it's important to really keep in mind that you need to balance energy still. Um, So if you're going on these crazy massive refeeds, but you're not balancing things for the week, it, it could have a negative impact on body composition. So um, those are just a, a couple, you know, reminders that I wanted to touch on that. Uh, I didn't really hear you guys bring up, but, um, that uh, again, like, I think, I think you guys covered the theoretical stuff. Uh, excellent. Any other closing points before we move on? Nope. No. So the next question is what happens to your body over time if you don't hit your protein numbers daily? So Pete, again, that's, that's, that, that has your name all over it. <laughs> Well, I think, I think it comes down to what, what do you mean by don't hit your protein numbers daily? Because, you know, there, there is an RDA for protein, um, which, you know, this gets back to what's necessary to live and what's optimal to get huge. Um, but you know, there, there is an RDA and if you, you know, are eating below the RDA and you're eating insufficient protein, you can have a number of health consequences. You can have protein, energy, malnutrition, um, you know, the, there's a lot of people on this planet who die from, you know, protein, energy, malnutrition and, um, you know, starvation and, and not having enough protein. Um, Definitely I'm, not Americans, though. No, not Americans. <laughs> we, we have plenty of protein available in this country. Um, we're not we're not scraping by for that. And so, um, you know, and so I think probably this question is getting at what if I don't get enough protein, like I don't get that one gram per pound. The question then, I think the answer then becomes, you know, I think we're getting back to splitting hairs, but how far below are we talking, you know? So, okay, you're dieting. Maybe the research shows you should have maybe a gram to 1.2 or 1.3 grams per pound when you're dieting and you have 0.8 or 0.9. 
you know, maybe it makes a small amount of difference, but again, there, there's, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, now if you go down to 0.5 or 0.6, yeah, you probably will see a difference, you know, but I, again, we're, we're in the U S where people who lift weights, I, I don't see that, that, you know, is being an issue. And so, you know, I think the biggest thing is, you know, like we talked about in the previous protein question, you know, if you're getting in the ballpark of a gram per pound and maybe a little bit more, if you're dieting, you know, you're, you're probably okay. Um, it, it, you know, it, if you if you're drastically below that, yeah, you're going to see differences. Um, yep. you know, someone eating 0.5 grams per pound in a deficit dieting to stage lean will most likely lose more muscle than someone eating 1.2 grams per pound. Um, you know, that, that, that's absolutely true, but, um, you know, it, you know, I guess it depends on how far below are we talking, you know, it would be the, you know, my question. And um, ultimately, I, I think if you get in the ballpark, you'll probably be OK as long as it's not something drastically low. Yeah, I think I think that's really the, the huge part of it is like um, after really a decade of being involved in this and uh, really obsessing over stuff like that for a long period of time, I've, I've kind of and, and really relatively not now. I've kind of come to notice that if you really want to see these um, dramatic differences of like what happens if you don't do this or you don't do that, you have to basically go against every rule that you've ever learned <laughs> um, or even every pretty much like every bro uh, bro science recommendation to kind of mess things up. I, I think there's definitely um, there's gradients. So um, if someone's having you on like 400 500 grams of protein uh, as a 180 pounder, uh, that's clearly excessive. Um, but you obviously still, you, you won't be getting the negative benefits of not having enough protein there. Um, but I, I think I think to really see a major difference, really, Pete, what, what you kind of hammered home there was you'd probably have to go for this, what did I say, 180 pounder? You'd probably have to go like to some obscenely low level that you, if you're in fitness, you're probably not going to go to like, like 60, 70, less than hundred grams. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm sure it's been studied. Um, and I'm sure someone, someone could dig up some data on, on talking about, you know, the, the quantifiable change in lean body mass. But, but again, I guess addressing the question, what happens to your body? Um, you'd probably have to undo everything that you're currently doing to really see those negative effects. Um, or I, I, if you have a coach kind of just go against them or something, you know what I mean? Um, Mike, anything, anything, uh, to add on there? Yeah. I would also just add, um, you know, like how often is this happening in yep. regards to like the magnitude of it? You know, if, if, you know, you miss, if you're, you know, 20, 30 grams under your protein, for like one day, it's not going to be a big deal. But, you know, to really echo, you know, like the deficiency versus adequacy, you know, if you're chronically deficient over time, that's where we're really going to start to see some problems. And, you know, I, I dealt with a number of, you know, malnourished individuals um, when I was working in the hospital. Um, and, you know, these individuals, are, you know, they're malnourished, they're wasting away um, from, you know, from various things, but in part, you know, inadequate protein over long periods of time. So actually, thank you for, for bringing that up. Cause one of the, the parts I feel like I missed in, in my monologue there was, um, address or, or noticing the importance or the, uh, the idea that this, this idea of having protein just for muscle mass and performance is it obviously doesn't just have that function physiologically in, in the body. So the only thing that you will see is not like, Ooh, I'm getting smaller. You're most likely going to notice other things. Um, if you are getting that low and one of them, like Pete kind of mentioned and Mike did too, is you will actually notice a difference in fluid distribution. Um, but we're talking like deficient protein. The other thing too, is you will see performance start to drop off if it's, if it's not. So if you are tracking your numbers and you see you've been low, you will see other things that are um, that are happening that you can likely attribute it to other than like, I feel smaller looking in the mirror. That's most likely not, not a, a justified reason, um, to freak out. Um, but you guys cool with moving on? Yeah. Yeah. I, I okay. was just, I just have one more, one more thing actually. So, yep. 
Um, you know, when you talked about the extremely high protein, I think too with that, it comes back to where your cal. you know, if you're gonna go a little higher on protein, you know, so say some guy goes up to 1.5 grams per pound, you know, or something like that, you know, I think the question becomes then, where are your calories? Um, yep. You know, if, if you are grinding, you know, you're, you're 2000 calories or below, you're a guy, you're grinding, you know, getting stage lean and you're up, you know, eating 1.5, two grams per pound, that's going to take away from carbohydrate and fat you can have. And, you know, inadequate carbohydrate, inadequate fat, you, you may see detriments, you know, um, someone who's eating 4,000 calories a day, you know, if, if you're up around 1.5 or two grams per pound of protein, but you're putting down 4,000 calories, 5,000 calories a day, you probably have plenty of carbohydrate and fat to go around. So it's not the end of the world. And, you know, in reality, the bro in me, when, when my, when intake starts getting really high like that, I typically do raise intake, protein intake up a little bit so that the individual's taking down some complete sources of protein, um, mm -hmm. rather than getting it all as, you know, incomplete sources from fat and carbohydrates, you know, being so high. Um, but that's probably the bro in me. Um, but, you know, I think that's just something important to note too, is, is if you're going to go higher on protein, you know, what, where are your calories would be a, you know, a question I would ask. Yeah, that's a great point. There is, there is such a thing as, uh, excessive amounts that aren't going to help performance. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a perfect, uh, point to, to move on. Uh, question six, can you supplement creatine throughout a bulk and a cut? Can creatine help you get leaner and harder? So since I've spent a lot of my life on, on creatine, uh, I'll kind of start there. The first simple answer is absolutely. There's really no reason. Uh, the, the, the data on creatine basically shows that you don't have an issue with, uh, down regulation to a point where you need to cycle it. Like, it, like if it was an anabolic drug where you have negative feedback, um, if you did, it's important for whatever reason you wanted to cycle it. If you did, you actually have to stay off it long enough. So it clears. So about 28 days, uh, not like this one week, two week thing. Um, and can it help you get leaner and harder? That's a difficult question just because, um, and I don't know how, how much this still exists out there, but there was before a lot of controversy over creatine and, and fluid balance. And so the, one of the benefits of creatine is that it's an osmolite, which means it pulls fluid, um, into the cell with it and, or just simply it draws fluid just like sodium does. Um, and that's actually why creatine is beneficial beyond just muscle performance. It actually helps with hydration. Um, but the interesting part is you don't get all of it intracellularly. You, you do get some extracellular fluid shift as well. Uh, that whole concept of holding water, like is creatine going to, you know, make you not lose the water or whatever for, for shows I've, I've never dropped it, uh, like for peak weeks again, for the muscle fullness benefit, um, it actually would be more advantageous rather than, rather than not. The other thing too, with getting leaner and harder is it's probably the most, um, studied and supported ergogenic aid we have for, um, high intensity, basically the, the, the exact type of contractions and activity you do when you lift weights, um, for enhancing performance of that. So is it immediately going to help you get leaner and harder? It's not going to be like an anabolic steroid, but if you're talking about supplements who have the most data, this is going to be the one that will help you actually perform best. So over time, if it helps you perform more volume, um, and progressively overload better, most likely, yes, it will help you get leaner and harder by way of improving muscle mass. Um, but the idea of like this one direct pathway of creatine acting like, um, I don't know, like some muscle hardening agent like DHT or something, uh, definitely not, not, not going to have that type of uh, profound effect. Ironically, as a kind of side note, I remember there was a study on uh, creatine and DHT levels, and actually they found that it did slightly... Um, increased DHT levels. And there was some concern over creatine in your hairline and stuff like that. But, um, I'm not sure how valid that concern is. I remember it was kind of, uh, talked down quite a bit. Uh, cause again, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure it didn't take anybody to the upper end of physiological range or outside of it. Um, anyway, uh, 
open for you guys as well. Uh, Mike Niadlik started, or you can you can start first. Yeah, no, I I agree um, with all of that. Um, did you recently synthesize creatine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm actually um, this this will be a, a spoiler for anybody who who's uh, who's listening to this. So the plan is to actually go through and record the the route of how most creatine is made, and then I'm actually going to make creatine HCl too because I feel like there's still like some wonder over that, uh, that new form. Cause it's the only one that's really people are using uh, other than monohydrate and it, because you make a salt, it is higher water solubility. So the plan is to actually go through the route of both of those based on the patents that like, uh, Degusa or Crea Pure, those companies use. Sorry, that was a hijack, Mike. Go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. I asked the question, but um, yeah, no. I don't have any. I don't have anything in particular to add to this one. Pete. Yeah, the only thing I would say is, you know, I, I think you went. You talked about not taking creatine away before a show, and yeah, I never have clients take it out either. It's not going to make you retain water during peak week or anything like that. Um, if anything, it's going to help because it helps pull water into muscle. Um, it yep. helps you look more full, um, and you know. It goes back to, you know, most people, most competitors at a show who say that they're holding water and they're natural, the overwhelming majority enough. are just not lean enough. Like, it, yep. it's not water. You're, you're just not lean enough. You God know? damn it, Pete. It was the creatine. The creatine <laughs> got me in the last week. That's why I placed 10th. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, creatine's not going to make you hold crazy amounts of water. I mean, if you're lean, if you're really lean, you're just going to look hard all the time. For the most part, yeah. I mean, you'd be flat a lot of the time, probably if you're natural, but you're you're gonna look h- relatively hard all the time. So, Pete, really quick, I'm gonna jump in there. Um, just hold your thought. Uh, I just want to branch off a little bit on what you said there. Is if you've been using this compound for the 20 weeks of your prep, you will have a very clear idea of how it impacts you, both visually and physiologically. So magically in that last week, if you're holding the same dose for the past 20 weeks, you have a well-controlled uh, situation there. So it's not going to shift your fluid balance in that last week magically. So it, it, there is no logical reason to remove it, especially on those grounds if you've had it in for a long time. Continue. Sorry about that. No, I mean, that, that was pretty much all I had is just, yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> so you guys cool to move on to question seven? Sure. Yeah, sure. That is, assuming calories and macros are controlled, are there any foods or micros that are inherently unhealthy? And they listed a couple examples like certain fats, oils, nitrates, or nitrites, processed foods, etc. Mike Niedlik. Sure. So I think just the, the general statement kind of disclaimer is that it really comes down to the dosages, um, you know, overall habits lifestyle behaviors, um, you know, is the individual generally healthy or do they have other conditions that might, you know, affect how their body handles certain nutrients. Um, but really, you know, the dosage and their overall, their overall habits. Uh, in particular, I can think of a couple um, that really just have like no merit or redeeming quality. Um, and the first one would be the trans fat. Yep. Um, so not only does trans fat increase LDL, uh, but it also decreases HDL. Um, and Why don't just briefly define what those are and, and why people should care in case yeah, they don't know? Absolutely, yeah. So LDL is, quote-unquote, the bad cholesterol, and HDL is, quote-unquote, your good cholesterol. Um, and increases in, HD, uh, increases in LDL and decreases in HDL are, they're both going in unfavorable directions. Um, so, again, really no redeeming quality towards trans fat for your body. Um, and then if someone regularly consumes, you know, smoked or charred meats, fish, and poultry, um, there are some carcinogenic compounds called heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, so when you heat those foods to a high temperature, these carcinogens form, um, and they kind of come along for the ride if you regularly eat those foods. Um, so while they're not necessarily a particular nutrient that we're seeking out or that's purposely added to the food, um, you know, being a carcinogen, there's no benefit to that. Pete? Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say, I, I, that's kind of my thoughts too, is, you know, first thing that came to my mind was 
you know, if we're talking about individual nutrient that I, I you know, we're really, I don't see a whole lot of benefit at all from consuming it. It's probably trans fat was the first thing I thought of, but um, charred foods, yeah, that smoked foods, that would actually be a good one too. Um, but the biggest thing I, I was thinking too is, yeah, it, it depends upon the dosage. Um, you know, the dosage is what makes things toxic, yep. you know? And so there, I mean, there's liter in the literature there, there are, there's evidence of, you know, I think Inuit people or, or explorers that went up into the Arctic, um, who ate polar bear livers, which were so high in vitamin A that they died. Um, <laughs> You know, and Sorry, but, that's that's not funny, but it's just kind of crazy. It's like, man, yeah. you get every extreme on Earth. Yeah, and so you know, because they, they were eating every part of the animal. I mean, they ate what they you know could, could capture, and so um, you know, vitamin A, we need that. You know, eat your tomatoes and carrots and things like that to get vitamin A. And um, but God damn it, Pete, it's natural. Yeah, it can't, yeah, it can't be too bad. much of that you die. Um, there's also <laughs> people who have died from water consumption. You know, there there's people who have gone to like raves and you know come out of there really really thirsty and down too much water and died um and so you know we need water obviously every day too and so you know the toxicity is in the in the dosage you know and um some things the toxicity is lower than others and you know there there's usually for most things some most of the nutrients um, a lot of the fat soluble nutrients and some of the minerals um you know once you get above a certain point there can be problems but there's still things we need for optimal health um, and so, yeah, the toxicities in the dosage would be my biggest thing. So I'm just going to give a, a, to me, comical visualization of what I, what I think about when I think, uh, when I, when I read like questions that are similar to this, um, is I imagine we're, we're not in this highly developed society where we have food readily available. And I picture like the most, the most processed thing possible that has like, trans fat and has everything that we, we kind of just went over like let's just say like a snickers bar and someone's literally they're, they're it's like a caveman on on a rock and they're starving and they refuse to eat the snickers bar <laughs> because you know what i mean so in these extremes like the reality is and and this was something that was actually hammered into my head quite a bit actually both of you guys probably had this too from my prof my nutrition professors in um in undergrad is when we're talking about like pure survival there really is no on um, there's no bad food because it's providing you something that you need to survive i i think a, a huge part like pete said is the death is in the dosage so if you're constantly a over consuming energy b over consuming these things that actually have no beneficial physiological role then you're going to actually then it's something you should be concerned about. But you do get natural trans fats from stuff like dairy. So um, this outright like witch hunt and avoidance, it's it's not really necessary. It's it's really when you're when they're in foods to preserve them so the, the fat doesn't get oxidized, that's more concerning when they actually change the chemical makeup uh, of the quote unquote Franken food. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on a little bit was just, um, since they mentioned it, nitrates and, and nitrites. Um, I, I've, I've always found this one kind of ironic because I remember when there was this wave of nitrate supplementation coming in and it was getting really popular. I remember thinking that that was kind of like a nutrition nutritional red flag. And because there was an interest of putting it into one of our products, I kind of delved a little bit deeper into it. And, and the reality is the nitrates that are in as preservatives are the same nitrates that we're actually utilizing in beets to enhance performance because they do have a large impact on um, nit nitric oxide production. Uh, so a lot of the concern is actually over increased risks of stomach cancer with that. And there have been correlations, but there's still so much debate over it that no one really has reached this disagreement. But the reality is um, that the nitrates in beet juice are actually uh, what are the purported uh, thing that's enhancing performance. So um, that's that's a very interesting one. And to be honest, it actually the kind of black eye from uh, from those those studies prevented me from putting it in because I played with sodium nitrate quite a bit uh, in putting it into like a pre-workout formula and that actually prevented uh, us from doing it. So 
I, I don't think we're at a place where it's definitive, but interesting nonetheless um, that a performance enhancer, enhancer is also something that people outright were trying to avoid and maybe still are trying to avoid with, um, with processed meats and stuff like that. Uh, before we move on to second and last question, anybody, any capstones there? No. Nope. So question eight is I've recently read that protease is the enzyme that aids stomach acid in the digestion of proteins. The body naturally produces this enzyme, but could what the body naturally naturally produces not be sufficient for athletes? Assuming that lifters require more protein than the average person, would they require an additional boost in this enzyme to completely digest the increased protein intake? Pete. Um, so for a healthy person, I don't know if I've seen any evidence that, that it's really necessary. Um, you know, protein is, from what I've seen, protein is digested and absorbed really pretty efficiently, even at incredibly <coughs> high dosages. Um, I know people, you know, have always said, oh, you can only digest, absorb however much at a meal. No, you can digest and absorb a lot at a meal if you're a healthy individual. Um, you yep. know, and I mean, it makes sense if you look at, you know, evolutionarily, I mean, we need amino acids, so it's going to be, we need to be efficient at utilizing them to stay alive when we have them available. Again, uh, picture, picture that guy who's like, literally all he has is like, I don't know, like a goat in front of him. And he's like, <laughs> damn it. No, I have to die. Like, I don't have enough protease. I'm not going to make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's not going to stop at like 30 grams of protein or something. You know, he's going to eat. I've maximized MPS. Nope. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, for someone healthy, no, but, you know, for a clinical population, they, they do use digestive enzymes and you guys have more, you know, have a good, clin probably more of a clinical background than I do. Um, but, you know, for proteases, you know, they, they do give digestive enzymes to people with um, uh, pancreat, like uh, pancreatitis, I believe. Um, and, and some of the other, I, I believe some of like cystic fibrosis or, or, I think, or, or yep. you guys can probably yep. speak to that more than I can. Um, but there, there are clinical conditions where people are deficient in digestive enzymes, where they will provide digestive enzymes for medical reason. Um, but I, I don't think that, that, you know, for someone who's healthy, I, I probably wouldn't worry about it. Mike, go ahead before I jump in there. Sure. Yeah. Um, everything that Pete said, I'm right on board with. Um, just for... Um, that this individual's own clarification, I would just say um, that, you know, just so they understand proteases, there are a class of enzymes that um, help digest proteins. There's, there, it's not just one protease, there, there's multiple in there. Um, but, um, but yeah, that was the only clarification point that I wanted to really make was that there, it's not just one protease throughout the body. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna, I guess, pop off a couple different anecdotes. One of them is just an interesting industry tr trend that I noticed was happening and ca has kind of fallen to the wayside. Um, and for whatever it's worth, this may speak to answering the question, maybe not, but I think it does actually speak to necessity of these things. Um, there was a period of time where a lot of protein companies were adding in uh, different proteases a as a, a blend to uh, protein powders. And then there was also people putting in like bromelain and papain that are actually uh, enzymes that are in uh, pineapple that aid in protein digestion. And <clears throat> to my knowledge, there was never anything that actually showed they enhanced anything tangibly. Uh, so that trend has, has gone kind of to the wayside. Um, the body is amazingly efficient, uh, as is. So things like this, as, as Pete said, about like clinical scenarios where we actually see what's happening when you don't have enough, um, you would notice a lot of other things rather than the fear of not having enough. Like there are real uh, scenarios where people have uh, like GI distress and issues or some type of malnutrition where we know they're actually not getting, they're not extracting enough from the foods that they're eating. Um, so I think one advantage that that clinical the clinical aspect gives us for pulling into the the fitness and bodybuilding populations is we actually can see what real tangible deficiencies are and how they manifest and um it like 
again, you would most likely notice, and I'm not talking about like protein farts or anything from eating a huge bolus dose of protein. Like you would, you would know, things would be happening where you'd um, like drops in performance or like extreme discomfort that aren't like uh, lactose intolerance um, from having these foods. Um, so yeah, you, you would definitely notice. It wouldn't be a, a what if, it would be like, something's happening, I need to address it. Um, you guys cool with moving on to the last question? Yeah. Yeah. Final question is how do you go about gaining muscle after cutting on really low calories for an extended period of time? So we'll just go through the same order, uh, Mike Niedlik and then Pete, and then I'll kind of cap it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep it simple. Train hard and eat enough calories. So after, after a diet or a deficit, um, you know, your goal is to get out of that deficit. Um, and you know, it, depends on how lean you got during it. You know, if you were a bodybuilder and got stage lean, that's not a healthy weight or body composition to stay at. So you're going to have an increased emphasis on, you know, putting on some, a reasonable amount of body fat, um, post show, and then getting calories up there higher. Um, you know, if you're like a power lifter who just dropped a few pounds for a meet, um, you know, chances are hopefully you didn't have to get your calories too low. Um, but really train hard and eat enough Pete? Yeah, I, I think my first thought was too is, is how lean are we talking at the end of this cut? Um, you know, someone who's stage lean is, you know, going to be in a place where that's not sustainable. You know, hormone levels are low, metabolic rates lower, strength probably is, you know, down, you feel like crap. Um, there's plenty of case studies, including the one on myself that shows um, detriment, you know, it, it's just not a place to, to stay long term. And so for someone like that, you're going to want to increase food quicker um, and get yourself probably into a surplus so that you're gaining weight um, and gaining some fat back uh, quickly. And, and if you look at some of the data, Eric Trexler's study that just came out, uh, most of the weight that was gained in the first three months after a contest uh, was body fat, the, like 90 some percent um, is based nearly all body fat. Um, and that's not a, I mean, it does. It makes sense. You're in such a bad place hormonally, and you're so primed for fat gain when you're that lean. Mm -hmm. um, but it, and also, you need that fat. You know, you need to gain some body fat. And so it's it's not necessarily a bad thing that you're gaining fat. It, you know, I I would just control it so that it doesn't become excessive. Um, and you know, for someone on the other hand who's dieting down to a sustainable level of lean, you know, bump yourself back up toward you know around maintenance and and probably add calories back slower. And you know if if, you know, find a place where you're maintaining, or maybe if you're going into a lean gain phase, maybe slowly gaining. Um, it doesn't need to be this massive surplus where you're adding a ton of fat, you know, body fat. Um, you know, it, it can just be something more gradual if you're in a sustainable place. Um, so I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, how, how lean did you get? But in general, I mean, yeah, increase food, lift heavy stuff, um, you know, recover. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything um, really profound to add to that, I would just speak to the subjective, which is, um, I think if, if you've noticed that you've been on a diet for this period of time and it's pretty significantly impacted your life, I think the behavioral and psychological things would be the ones to, um, ensure you, you get stable again. So like Pete kind of said, getting back to a place where, um, you can kind of live a fairly normal life but not doing extremes and not treating it as an emergency. So if you're binging and you're doing it repeatedly, that's not a logical return to uh, gaining muscle and, and improving anything. Um, but I think, uh, and also on the flip side, uh, staying super low for the fear of gaining body fat is, is not an adv advantage either. So I think um, it's, again, if, if you notice that there's no clear signs of, of major issues other than feeling super hungry, um, take your time. Like don't, again, don't make it an emergency if it's not. Uh, so try to get those things back in order, but don't rush. Don't try to reinvent the wheel or anything like that. Um, these things, I think we tend to treat them a lot more like, like as this like black and white thing, whereas there's just like this massive gradient where, uh, people diet and then as soon as they finish the show or something, it's like, all right, tomorrow I'm going to kickstart into gaining muscle mass. And the reality is like, if fine, if you want to try to flip that switch like that, 
um, you also enter in a lot more risk of increasing body fat beyond a point which is actually beneficial. Um, anybody have anything in closing? Yeah, I actually just have one one thing I thought of. You know, there, there's been some, there are a few studies that of people going through prep, and they've they've put on some lean mass during that during that during that prep. Um, so, you know, it, it extends to your point that there's not this you know, drastic line in the sand shift where you're all of a sudden yeah. gaining and not gaining. Um, and training you know, is a big part of that. Yeah. Pete, anything else before we sign off? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would agree. I mean, I think in the early stages of prep, you can probably put some muscle on. I don't know that deep in prep, I don't know that anyone's putting muscle on who's natural and you know what I mean? Really lean. I, I think most of us see a drop in performance as much as we try to prevent it, um, we, we still see it when we're that lean. Um, I, I definitely do. Um, and, you know, it, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the goal should still be trying to progress in the gym, lift heavy weights, and, and hold on to as much muscle as you can, even when you are extremely lean. Yeah, I, that is, um, I'm at my shut up point. I have nothing else to add. Um, Thank you guys again. Thank you, Pete and, and Mike, for coming on again um, and giving awesome answers as usual. And uh, thank you guys for your submissions. And we will see you back in roughly a month for the Physiology 2 panel. <laughs>